Hello, hello, and welcome to Common Censored. I'm Lee Camp here with Eleanor Goldfield. Hello, hello. This is the show where we talk censored stories and people, sensible solutions, and common ground movements to fight and build. And sometimes other stuff. Other stuff. You threw them off halfway. You got I'm halfway trying to, the to you know, shit. I'm trying to uh, mix it up here because I feel like the entire world is on repeat. <laughs> What was so that I'm meme going around saying uh, it's a weird leap year where April's 300 years long? Oh, yeah, or whatever. yeah. It's like it's, it's, it's an interesting leap year. Uh, February was 29 days long. March was uh, 300 days long. And a- April is five years long. Yeah, that's, <laughs> that, that's what it's going to start feeling like soon. I uh, hope everybody's out there doing all right. Hope you're uh, staying. But not out there. What's that? Not, but not out there. Not out I there. hope you're mostly staying home. Oh, yeah, yeah. I meant out in the world, but not in your house or in your house. All right, whatever. Uh, (laughs) It's got to be your bowl. (laughs) It's got to be your bowl. Um, Thanks so much for joining in. And I hope uh, I hope most everyone is uh, safe and healthy in these bizarre times. Uh, Let's get in. We'll we'll have some more coronavirus stuff in a minute. But let's start with Bernie Sanders has endorsed. Uh, who is it? I need to check my script here. Uh, it looks like Meg Ryan. Actually. Uh, endorsed Joe Biden for the presidency of the United States. Um, that's right. Despite the recommendation of, I think, most of the world, he has <laughs> endorsed a doddering zombie mannequin who needs to have his eyelids held open with toothpicks and uh, <laughs> his legs are put together with silly putty. I don't like it's it. I mean, it's, I did a moment of clarity on this where I was much angrier. So I got it out. So that's why you're not hearing the screaming right now. Uh, I also, as you and I have said many times on this podcast uh, or in various outlets that we, we knew, you know, Bernie Sanders had said he would support whoever the nominee was. He had even said, uh, much to people's chagrin, that if going into the convention, he did not have a, uh, he, he, sorry, let me back up. He had even said that going into the convention, whoever had a plurality, meaning whoever even had one more delegate than other people he would endorse. Which Meaning is interesting because he, he was not... the only person to say that. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. They, they all, all the rest were. Oh, oh no. He, well, they also asked him, didn't they? Who, whether they think the person with the most votes should win. And right. he was the only one who said yes. Yeah. Uh, but no, he, he had made it very clear. And in 2016, he made it clear that he would endorse whoever the Democrat was. And, but it's still disgusting and it's disgusting for, I, I, there's many reasons, but I think uh, it comes down to a very simple one, which is a revolutionary political movement. He called this a political revolution and political revolutions do not endorse the opposite of everything they stand for. That's not a political revolution. Well, it would be like it would be like if the Jacobins in revolutionary France were just like, you know what? Actually, let's just endorse the king. <laughs> um, so you uh, saw this coming? Yeah, I did, and I, that doesn't mean that it hurts any less. Uh, I totally get that it's it's incredibly painful. Um, especially in in a year like this and especially when Bernie was the only person that was really talking about universal health care at a time when that's obviously really important and on everyone's minds um yeah, but he made, it's he made, also he made that a simple a, a central plank of his campaign it and to the to not you know ad nauseum like you would I couldn't listen to his speeches because it was just about how terrible our health care is and how everybody's fucked and I know all those numbers and so uh but I felt that he should be out there doing it but that was the center of everything he talked about was like health care without, you know, if people are going bang for health care. They can't do this. If they're worried about their kids, they can't do this. They, like he talked about other things, but that was the center. And now it's like, when is that more important than right now in the middle of a pandemic? Well, and I think so. Here's the important thing. Uh, well, there's a lot of important things, but Bernie was actually I think this was last time, like 2016, 
where he was quoted as saying, I'll never tell you who you who to vote for, and if I do, don't listen to me. Right, and it's like, right. well, the, well, he said it himself, folks. Don't follow him down that path, because we know exactly where that path leads. And, for, and, I, and I've talked about this on some other podcasts like uh, uh, By Any Means Necessary and Political Misfits on, on Sputnik, which are also great podcasts uh, that folks should check out. But I, I talked about this because people are understandably upset. Like, why the fuck isn't Bernie fighting? Why isn't he saying, no, hell, this is this is absurd. I'm going to run it as an independent or I'm at the very least going to point out what a d- absolute dipshit Biden and the Democrats are. But that's just not Bernie. And I think it, it's super important that we uh, that we accept Bernie for who he is. He's a guy that has really powerful perspectives on a lot of things. I wouldn't call them radical <laughs> because they're like what the center of most, most European countries, countries yeah. would just say, yeah. They're radical for <laughs> our right-wing America. Um, but he has some good ideas, but he is not a savior. And I think that it's it's so important, particularly now when folks are really reeling from the current crisis, that we not look for a savior because there isn't one, right? Even if Bernie somehow had 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 defeated the Democratic establishment and come out as the candidate, that he was still never going to be a savior. And the reason that he was a threat at any point to the establishment wasn't because of him, but it's because of the people power that he engaged. So that means that what the establishment has always been afraid of, is afraid of, is not Bernie. It's his ability to rile people up because they fear the people. That has always been the case. Right. So if we take these ideas and move on beyond Bernie, we can keep being a threat. But if we just give in because the figurehead is old, then... Uh... Well, and, and to be perfectly honest, it's not like, you know, taking these ideas further. These ideas have been around. Um, no, he been... made them all up, <laughs> is what I heard. <laughs> Uh, giving, giving people health care is all he just came up with it and i do think that f- people people feel deflated and you know I, and i had this conversation with some folks in the mutual aid network because uh the day that he the the, the day that bernie uh, suspended his campaign there were several folks that commented in the signal thread i'm feeling like shit today someone send me cat memes and so i get like mm, i yep. get that people feel shitty and it's important you know take your time to sit there and ugly cry while eating out of a pint of ice cream do that do whatever you got to do but don't let this be a way for like a reason to just sit back and watch the world burn. If anything, this is just yet another uh, indication of how broken and how horrifically uh, oppressive our system is and why we have to stand up. And as we talked about in, in the last episode, the, the way that we're dealing with this, for instance, in, with regards to mutual aid, the way that we're coming together and getting shit done, not only in, uh, in, in spite of, uh, of the crisis, but in spite of government obstruction. I mean, there are actually government agencies that are trying to keep mutual aid workers from doing their job. So if we can get shit done, if we can take care of people on the ground in these moments of, of, of horrific crisis, then you're damn straight that we can shift the trajectory of our system but we have to be very clear on how we do that. And how we do that is not pedestaling any one person, but it is working together in these autonomous uh, and, and, uh, and, and non-hierarchical groups. Damn straight. Uh, but to go back to how this, that's never been who Bernie is and in, within his movement, they... Sorry, I just realized I went off on like a mutual agent, uh, mutual aid tangent kind of like how walter and the big lebowski brings everything, everything to, to vietnam <laughs> I, that, that's everything that's where in your I world, right everything now. in your world now comes everything back to mutual yes <laughs> if you say grapes i'm gonna manage to find a fucking way to bring that back to mutual aid so um, i'm sorry emergency grape delivery for uh, <laughs> someone who needs them uh I, well i hear you but you made a lot of good points within it um and people can just uh, ignore the ones that didn't matter <laughs> uh, no i'm kidding it all mattered but uh bernie also has never had a, a record of calling out election fraud, as we've seen mm-hmm. it again and again and again and again. I mean, 2016, state after state, you could 
pinpoint how these things were rigged, how it was uh, fucking manufactured against him. I mean, you know, even things that were ultimately proven in court, like the hundreds of thousands purged from the voter rolls in Brooklyn alone. Uh, you could prove some of these things. These are not people love to, you know, say like, oh, we, 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 what crazy stuff they're saying about election fraud. No, the, many of these things were proven and were obvious. Uh, and then there's a lot of stuff that can't be proven, like what the fuck's going on in the inside the voting machines. Mm -hmm. But uh, and he's never called almost any of it out like ever. That has not been his thing to act like any part of this system of, of voting is not legitimate when, in fact, we've seen so much of it not be legitimate. I mean, he really does, does not call out this stuff. And even when it, it was called out occasionally, rarely from his campaign, like asking about the final vote in Iowa or whatever, uh, th that was usually not coming from him. It was usually coming from some campaign staff that I think he was like, all right, well, you go do it. Um, but anyway... Yet again, they manufactured this thing against him, just as in 2016. Uh, sadly, those of us who were very cynical about it, like myself, thinking, well, it's just going to be the fucking same shit. I mean, there, nothing's changed. They haven't changed the election system at all. Uh, you know, really, nothing's going to change. And sure enough, here we are. And this manufacturing went up to the top like right. it did last time. You had... Obama was and the him. Clintons talking to, initially talking before Super Tuesday, the day before Super Tuesday, basically the writing was on the wall. Bernie was going to win this thing. He had an 80% chance of getting a plurality, if not a majority of delegates going into the convention. And it was, it was basically over. And Obama and the Democrat, the Democratic establishment ran around and got Buttigieg and Klobuchar and Beto O'Rourke and Kamala Harris and all Cory Booker and all of them to suddenly go running to Joe Biden. And, oh, we're all endorsing Joe Biden. We're jumping out of this race, even though Biden won, had won one contest by that point uh, after three presidential runs. That was his first state win, South Carolina. And they went running to him, endorsed him. And all of a sudden, Super Tuesday had this crazy shift. Oh, my goodness. Oh, all the polling places in Hispanic areas accidentally closed. And all the provisional ballots were forced on young people. And oh, my goodness, all these things changed all at once. And clearly it's because just the Democratic Party just united around Biden. And they just, wow, they just saw what a great guy he was, what a great campaigner he was, how how wonderful a brain he had on those shoulders and just what a great record he has and nothing in his past that could possibly hurt him in the future so i understand why they all just went running to biden and they were like this is our guy and so everyone united behind you know joe biden before super Tuesday. i mean it was utter horseshit and it was manufactured at the toppest level with at the, at the toppest level the top <laughs> level when I get angry enough, I start making up words. Is that um, the tapas level? Uh, like the, the, the small plate? plate? The, the, okay. the, the what? The tapas. Like oh, the, the tapas plate. level. Sounds, I like that. It sounds delicious. <laughs> I will hang out at the tapas level. <laughs> Um, but yeah, Obama was calling Buttigieg and pressuring him. And I don't know what the fuck they offered Buttigieg, probably some cabinet position or something in the next administration. And then he'll get to run again in four years or something or five, eight years, whatever. All this shit they offer these people. And anyway, it was just so manufactured. And then even Bernie's en endorsement was manufactured because apparently he had several calls with Obama pressuring mm -hmm. him to endorse. Uh, Hillary was involved in this as well. And Bill Clinton and calling Elizabeth Warren on a regular basis. And, um, and you know, she was the only one who didn't, after that Super Tuesday thing, didn't endorse Biden. And, well, and it think... was probably because they had said, realized that she was pulling a lot from Bernie. So she was the one to leave in the race. I think you can you can learn a lot about how strongly the Democrats feel about Biden just judging by how long it took Obama to say anything. I got an email on my account, I think it was today, which is Tuesday, April 14th, that finally said Obama endorses no, Biden. No, he, he endorsed either. It, it was either today or yesterday. It's yeah. just embar Dude was your VP, man, yeah. like for eight years. And he was clearly the the one that the democrats were going behind and obama was just like i'm gonna hang back and see but yeah i mean i like this is and and here's the thing so i get that you know hope springs eternal as they say but i think we have to be realistic with what we hope for and the hope for bernie uh you know as 
as both you and I, Lee, have had, uh, said on our shows, uh, you know, I had Nick Brana, who's the founder of Movement for a People's Party, uh, who outlined this great, basically like the seven ways that the Democrats will steal this from Bernie again. And it's like, we have to accept this. You know, it's like, it's like if you go into the doctor, they're like, you have cancer. And you're like, well, I hope I don't. And it's like, but you do. <laughs> Yeah. What are you going to do about it? I mean, yeah. like that. This is this is where we're at. So, and I'm not I'm not trying to shit on people that were you know pushing for Bernie. I think that that's brilliant and powerful. Uh, but I also think that, like we really need to address the reality of the situation. We do not live in a democracy. Um, and even if Bernie would have gotten to the convention, if if we still have a convention, uh, even if Bernie would have gotten to the convention, the Democrats would literally have staged a coup in their own party to get rid of him. Like, they this, this is how much they hate him. They would have absolutely manufactured some extraordinary thing that right. meant that he could not be crowned the, the candidate. It would have been like some, you know, Russia connection that, oh, the, he can't be candidate anymore. So I think that we just have to, we have to be realistic with our hope. Uh, and instead of saying, I hope I don't have cancer let's look at i hope i beat this thing by doing these things uh and unfortunately one of those things in my opinion is not the ballot box like i totally get for you know for down ballot issues <laughs> for down ballot issues and for down ballot uh uh you know political candidates that you feel very strongly about particularly like in local spaces go for it but the idea that anything will change in the federal ba- ballot box of this fakakt system is unfortunately basically like saying i hope i don't have cancer when it's clear that you do the body politic is incredibly fucking sick it's on life support and us sitting here and being like i hope we don't have this terminal illness is not fucking helping anything uh i want to so i want to give out a theory here um and of course i agree with all that but uh i want to give out a theory here that i haven't heard anybody else say uh that this also shows i mean this thing was immensely rigged against him but let's face it he was he nearly won the thing against all odds, against all rigging, in 2016, before he had the machinery in place, the money system in place, the people in every state, the delegates worked out, the system already tried and true from 2016. That was before it he almost won. Then this time around, he should have, considering all that, run away with it. And he still nearly did, but was stopped. But he should have run away with it in such a way that they couldn't have stopped him without, you know, rigging some scandal where they claim he just can't run. Now, why didn't that happen? I think that this shows the diminished power of our social media presence. I think that over the course of the past Mm -hmm. 10 years, or what, let's see, let's go back to a little before Occupy. So, yeah, 10 years. Um the establishment, the cor- corporate America realized they were losing control of the message. And not just in big ways like which candidate was running, but also, and, and where the protests were like Occupy, but also in smaller ways like someone with just a little bit of media presence, a little bit of Twitter account, someone with a, you know, a, a, a slight Twitter celebrity level could cause a, a, a boycott of a company because th- something was wrong there. And I want to fast forward to today. I tweeted a story out about how Waffle House, their response, this Waffle House is a massive corporation, especially for those of you not within the U.S. Waffle House, they're all over the country. Their response to this crisis has been to actually cut workers' hours and pay in like half. Mm-hmm. So basically telling the managers, the ones they want to keep, because those are the higher level people, you have to work twice as as if you're twice as many people for half as much pay they've just been fucking over workers to try and make more money for themselves because they're suffering in this time so it's the opposite of what a company should do if they had any kind of moral standing or whatever so anyway i beside the point though uh but i tweeted that out and did at waffle house you know is is abusing their workers or anything and it got a almost nothing number of retweets like it's like 30 retweets or something you know and and i average i my tweets can average you know 500 to a thousand or something so that tells me that there's a pressure against it to not be retweeted usually when something's that low and i think it's because nowadays you even just comment on a corporation 
you say something that's important about uh, about our system, about our media, about our ruling elite, and it's going to be suppressed. It's going to be shut down. And I think that Bernie Sanders, his initial 2016, sorry if the studio's taking a while to get out, but... No, you're fine. I'm, uh, even, I think his 2016 run was based off of the power of our social media, and uh, same with Donald Trump, unfortunately, but our social media and our ability to create things like Occupy, which Occupy mm-hmm. s- was spawned from the power of people on social media talking about how we average people were being abused and how big banks were uh, robbing the country and everything else. And the, I think the, the corporate America realized they had lost control. And so now I think we, they have shut down. It's not just like me or something, you know, a lot of these conversations when I'm in interviews, they want to ask me about my personal suppression. I think it's far larger than that. And it's really any comments about that are critical of the media, of corporations. I mean, you see CNN clips on YouTube now. They all have millions of views. Everything's being funneled through your mainstream outlets. And they have really crushed the ability of alternative media, alternative thought. And by that, I just mean outside of the corporate media um, to get the message out there. And I've, I've watched many of my friends lose their ability to earn a living from this th- type of thing. And, and it's, I think they've really crushed that energy to a strong degree. And I think Bernie Sanders would have just swamped this thing if he had half the energy. And one final note is what made me think of this kind of larger theory was that uh, someone emailed me on Facebook today and they had not emailed me since 2014, which meant I saw their 2014 email to me and their 2014 emailed me on Facebook because I don't know this person was them going, wow, when you retweet a Bernie Sanders meme from your page, yours gets more shares than his does. Meaning back in 2014, my page, which is a pretty big Facebook page, uh, did better, was doing better than Bernie Sanders and was promoting Bernie Sanders' message. And that rose him and Occupy and all of all of us working together kind of rose those messages up and these anti-corporate messages where you get angry at a corporation and there'd be a scandal and they'd have to back off something. And it just seems like that has been fucking, it's hit a glass ceiling and now they're lowering the glass ceiling farther and farther until we're like mice, what, squeaking at an avalanche, mm-hmm. the, exp- the expression. But yeah, well, I think, um, I mean, it, it, we tend to look back with like rose colored glasses. It's not like you could have tweeted this thing out to Waffle House in 2014 and Waffle House would have. They would have folded. They would have <laughs> gone bankrupt. I'm pretty certain. Pretty certain. 90% certain. 99% certain. Uh, no, you're right. But I I think it, all I meant was that it would have gotten more retweets than 30. Sure. And, sure. And but I, I do think, think that now you can't. Things don't go viral like they used to. I never see anything go viral that's not completely vapid. Like I've never I, right. It's been but years I do think I've that seen... I do think that um, I lost my train of thought now. That's all right. <laughs> we like a good train of thought uh, experiment. Um, anyway, just a theory. But obviously, there is a lot of suppression going on online. Um, here's my question. My next question to you. Moving on to a uh, slightly different train of thought huh. is uh, do you foresee that the Democrats may already have in the works or an idea that as Biden continues to fuck up, continues to show his senility, uh, just can't carry this thing, they manufacture a reason to just say, oh, it's Andrew Cuomo is going to be the mm-hmm. can- the candidate or something like that. Well, I mean, possibly, but I think that, I mean, why not just pedestal, continue to pedestal Biden and have other people talk for him? Uh, I mean, I, I don't see a reason why you wouldn't, why you wouldn't just uh, go with that. Uh, What I was going to say, because I also don't give a flying fuck about Cuomo or Biden because they're both terrific. Um. This was our come on. This was our little politics moment before I know, we get to I know, the. You but don't I'm have sorry. To shit I'm, go- all over I'm my- going to go back to the <laughs> fuck the ballot box when it comes to the presidency moment. Uh, but over what I what, what I wanted to now I've lost my train of thought again. God damn it, Lee, you're killing me. Um, what I was going to say is that I think that the the 
paradigm has shifted. So no, you're not getting as many retweets in 20 as in 2014, but I think more and more people are seeing beyond the veil of the American exceptionalism and uh, seeing to the facade beneath. And I think that understanding is growing and that understanding is growing even more right now during the pandemic when people see that, uh, you know, that th- this, this is all fucking up and failing because of the system, uh, not in spite of the system working for everybody. No, it's because the system doesn't work for anybody. Uh, but the t- 0.01%. Uh, and that's why it's failing. And I think more and more people are coming to that realization. And I, I do think that in November, you're going to see, I mean, if we still have an election, uh, you're going to see mm-hmm. extreme drops in voter turnout. And it's not because people are going to be afraid to go outside. It's because people are going to look at these candidates. They're going to see two sexist, racist pieces of shit. And they're going to say, I don't care. I don't care. Because to be perfectly honest with you, people people didn't care back, you know, b- back when it was Hillary versus Trump. They were like, "I'm sorry, do you want me to choose between eating shit or vomit? I choose neither." Mm-hmm. And it's the same thing here again. I mean, the Democrats have actually outdone themselves. They've managed to find someone that was even less popular than Hillary Clinton, even less capable of of sounding like they actually give a shit about the average human being. And I think that people are not, you know, even though you don't have the reach that you did in 2014, and a lot of people don't, uh, p- the average people are less inclined to buy the bullshit anymore because the Democrats have just continued to be more and more overt about how much they don't care about the people uh, and just sort of leaning on those laurels of, oh, well, in if you're not a white, wealthy man, you have to vote for us because you don't have a choice. Uh, and I think that people are saying, well, I do. I could just not vote. And I think that the uh, that the importance here is that when people make that decision to just not vote, that there be something that fills that void, that you don't get sucked into a, a tunnel of nihilism, but instead you take that fuck this, you know, uh, completely corrupt voting system. I'm going to take this to the street instead. I'm I'm going to take this to a, a place outside of those, you know, closed polling places that you've shut down and outside of those black box voting machines and outside of this totally corrupt system. And I'm going to demand these basic human rights that you won't ever put on the ballot box anyway. You're not going to see universal health care on a ballot. You're not going to see the end of war on a ballot. You're not going to see a livable wage on a ballot. You're not going to see uh, guaranteed housing for all on a ballot. That shit will be one because people get out into the streets and they fucking demand it just like everything that's been a progressive uh move forward in this country that shit happened because people took to the streets not because they called their congress member i think that's uh, those are all great points and uh, one last thing i want to add is for those of you who have this thought in your mind which i think is a common thought when people say you know kind of a pox on both their houses these are not this is not a choice between uh biden and trump or hillary and trump and you know fuck it um a lot of people go well okay fine i agree with you but the judges it comes down to the judges Mm -hmm. and i just want to we don't need to spend a lot of time on this but i just want to remind you of two things one is biden helped make sure clarence thomas got on the supreme court all right he was running the committee he made sure anita anita hill did not get uh her fair hearing and other uh witnesses against uh clarence thomas got their fair hearing he made sure they did not so that he, he really got Clarence Thomas on that court, uh, who was one of the most egregious Supreme Justices to begin with. And then secondly, I want you to remember that uh, Kavanaugh and Merrick Garland, Merrick Garland was the one Obama tried to put up for the Supreme, Supreme Court. And uh, apparently Kavanaugh and Merrick Garland were on the same bench together for many years. And they voted together 91% of the time, meaning the difference between those Democrat judges and Republican judges is 9%. And I'm not saying that that doesn't matter sometimes, but let's forget this horse shit that we're going to elect 
uh, just fucking awful human beings uh, just for the judges. Well, right. And I think just just a final point on that. Uh, I, I, I remember back when I was interviewing uh, an activist about DACA, the, the, the Deferred Action Program, which was in front of the Supreme Court. And she said and she was she's from Peru and she she's a, a part of a DACA recipient. And she said, DACA is not enough. DACA doesn't doesn't uh, signify my humanity. It's it doesn't it doesn't allow me to live as a human being with rights in this country. Uh, that you know, and and she was making the point too that she's an indigenous person that is being told by a colonialist, racist, homicidal uh, or genocidal government that she's not valid as a human being, and making the point that DACA didn't go far enough. So it's not to say that the Supreme Court doesn't matter, but the decisions that they make are all based on this profit over people paradigm. So any quote unquote wins that you get through the Supreme Court will never actually go far enough in 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 actually addressing the basic human rights of people. And we have to do better. We can't take these breadcrumbs and say, thank you, masters. We have to do better than this. And I I'm not trying to say to people like, oh, if you vote, you're a fucking tool. I'm again, I'm saying like when it comes to down ballot shit and local elections, please do. But recognize that voting is like turning on your turn signal when you drive. It's not going to keep you from getting T-boned by a fucking 18 wheeler. And it's not going to help you uh, navigate the, 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 the streets of any city. You know, voting is is so basic. It, it doesn't. Garn- it shouldn't garner any applause. It's when just something right. that you do if you want. It, but it's the idea that that will significantly change the trajectory of this empire is ridiculous. And we really have to move away from that. Well, and you're right that where voting can matter is in the local stuff. Is in And the stuff you're talking about, for example, healthcare. most places that are getting that, it's being done on a state level. It's, you know, or, or something like a paid sick leave or maternity leave or living wage or whatever. Uh, so people really should fight for their local elections. But even beyond that, you can't just be voting. You've got to be active out in, in other ways. And uh, I want to get jump down to, because it fits kind of as a segue, I want to jump down to how we're, I think we're witnessing the end of the American empire. But before I get to get that, a couple of quick things. Uh, this show is, there's no ads on here. We don't do any of that shit. There's no uh, corporate sponsors. It's all supported by just you listening right now, you, and uh, just a couple of bucks over at patreon.com slash common censored keeps the show going and you can get the extra content every week. Um, so check that out, please. Patreon.com slash common censored. Also, my stand up comedy special is free for the first time. It's at Lee Camp dot uh, dot com. It's just on YouTube. You can just watch it. And uh, yeah, I hope you'll check that out. Also, the trailer for Eleanor's movie, which will be out in not too long, is at hardroadofhope.com. My book is now 10% off, my new book, Bullet Points and Punchlines. If you use the coupon code, the initials of the book, B-P-A-P-L, and that's at leecampbook.com. It's got an intro by Jimmy Dore and a forward by Chris Hedges, and I hope you'll check it out. And all of Eleanor's stuff and and Eleanor's writing, which she just had a great article on, you guessed it, mutual aid, uh, that's at (laughs) artkillingapathy.com. So I want to jump down to, uh, because I think that what we were talking about, everything you're talking about, about the stuff we can't vote for and the failures and everything, is leading us to what I think, I think we're witnessing the end of the American empire. And in largely that's about 90% a good thing. Uh, 10% of it, unfortunately, is that, you know, people can lose jobs and things like that and and suffer. Uh, I don't like to see people suffer, but let's face it, the American empire is a force uh, causing suffering around the world. It is a force of endless war and massive military and causing climate change and environmental destruction. And the reason I think we're seeing the end of it right now is on many levels. Uh, one is we've seen a complete lack of leadership in the coronavirus response. America has been on the ass end of any kind <laughs> of leading 
that has gone on globally, so much so that other countries are now basically just like, well, fuck that guy. Let's not talk to him because he's a, not just a moron, but an asshole. And we're going to go help each other over here. So, and we, on previous episodes, we've gone through some of the ways that countries are helping each other. And it's because America shows absolutely no leadership. And uh, it wasn't really showing leadership under Obama either, because Obama was also bombing all these countries and, uh, you know, just uh, utter, you know, economic war on other countries, just a utter catastrophe. And America has just proven that we cannot be a leader. We cannot be the world's only superpower. And so I think the fact that we are a laughing stock right now in this crisis that is a global crisis, uh, I think that is going a long way for decreasing the amount of any kind of remaining respect for um, the American empire. On top of that, we have an economic crisis, which is made that much worse by the way our country has been gutted and uh, exploited for the ruling elite. So the economic crisis is going to be worse here than it's going to be in countries where they have some sort of social safety net, even a minor one. Uh, so in, uh, th that economic crisis is going to multiply our lack of leadership and then we'll see the dollar going down as we've already been because they keep printing money, just trillions of dollars just dumped into the markets to try and prop things up, to try and keep the charade going. And so the dollar decreases in value. You also see countries uh, going around the dollar, like we talked about last week as well with, mm -hmm. the, uh, go with the going around the shank sanctions on Iran. And that shows two things. That shows going, you know, ignoring our, like our dollar rules everything, our economy rules everything. You guys can't do this around our bidding, our decision making, and uh, it so it decreases that way. It also shows that there's no respect for America because why should you respect us the way we've treated the world? Um, I, I think the and then to go back to what we were just talking about, Biden and Trump. When you offer no political alternative to a completely fucked up situation, a completely fucked up, almost dystopian world for so many Americans, then you can't keep an empire going mm -hmm. under that. Yeah, and I think I I, I think. I, I'm reminded as you were talking about, you know, the empires uh, failing, I was reminded of another article that I read in uh, Fairness and Accuracy in Reporting, which is a great outlet that uh, I know I quote a lot, but they had a, they had a piece today, I believe, that was uh, talking about uh, Bloomberg's coverage of Cuba sending doctors around the world uh, rather than bombs, <laughs> uh -huh. because basically, uh Bloomberg took this moment to point out that, uh, you know, yes, Cuba is sending doctors around the world, but, you know, we should be careful about, you know, giving them too much props for that because this will just, uh, this will uh, bolster uh, oppression back at home. Um, <laughs> so, meaning it in uh, Cuba. In Cuba, yes. Uh, so... So basically, the, one, of the, one of the quotes here is, allowing Havana to exploit the virus for hard currency will just empower repression at home. Uh, basically, you know, to, to say that, that giving Cuba any props and giving them space to, you know, to, to actually uh, get some financial assistance. Those evil doctors helping people. Well, and then, and then the, 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 the author of this article fails to to give any examples of what this repression is other than the fact that the Cuban government does not bolster the consumer economy and the emerging private sector enough. <laughs> so that is what they mean when they talk about Cuban repression is that the private sector doesn't get enough love. In Cuba. So they're not letting enough capitalism in. Exactly. And this is, and, and, and I mention this because this you know the the dying empire part of the the death knell and part of the swan song is lashing out We're right for death or rasp Ra oh i was going to say rattle rasp Ra you're right rattle, death rattle rattle, rattle. right yeah. <laughs> either way it's it's a grating sound um <laughs> and uh and I think like one of the important parts of this is not only lashing out in terms of like actual physical violence, be that, you know, uh, our bombing campaigns or our attempted coups, but it's also this very stacked and way more overt propaganda campaign. So this idea that you should shit on Cuban doctors because they're not like spreading 
the private sector, like the <laughs> the, the the gospel of the private they're just sector, giving it away for free. But they're, they're like instead whores. just they're giving sending away doctors medicine. around the world to like give people medical care. Those fucking assholes. And and I think like again like you you see more and more overt uh, attempts to pedestal a dying empire. The facade is like so cracked and broken that they're just desperately trying to make everybody that's not uh you know one of our quote-unquote allies uh like saudi arabia or something look like an absolute piece of shit for doing anything positive um you know this is uh this i think we spoke about this maybe on a live stream that we did or maybe it was another podcast but the fact that you know uh voice of america got shit for quote unquote making uh china look good when when they just know, when they when all voice of america which is a fucking propaganda machine all they said was wuhan is opening, opening up, up for, again for which is just like a fact that's I, happening I, I i don't know i don't think we covered it on here i think i just happened to be talking to you about it but uh yeah trump Trump was or Trump administration was furious at Voice of America, and I can't remember if they, they you know, so he, I can't remember if he tweeted or retweeted something about failing Voice of America, blah blah blah. Oh, is doing the doing the bidding of authoritarian China and all this shit, and you're like, Voice of America is straight up our propaganda uh-huh. outlet, and and all they do is our propaganda. It's just full on American propaganda, and they happen to tweet that Wuhan was opening up. Basically, because it is. Basically, yeah, because it literally <laughs> is. Basically, just a non-propagandistic, straight tweet of fact, and right. that was so so horrific that it infuriated the Trump administration. So yeah, that's my that that's that's the that's 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 my point here is that like we have to we we have to be very uh, um, very strong about the media literacy and I do think that that will get easier because of these kind of stories but it's super important that we don't uh, that we that we recognize what these sort of extreme and overt representations of pedestaling this dying empire are um, and that we not sort of get uh, you know, Pied Piper, let the Pied Piper draw us back into them when we want to go back to this sort of normal after this crisis is over. Uh, well, thank God we have the private sector. We're not like those goddamn Cubans. You know, like this sort of, well, it, it, it can be very, very tempting to be drawn back into this. Right. And we really have to maintain well, f- and build that media literacy and make sure that we're we're really seeing these stories for what they are and seeing what these stories are trying to paper over, which is that uh, that cracked facade of the dying empire well they have to use fear they have to use fear to try and get people back in line so they say you're they're going to get you and we're the only ones that can take care of you and so they get them into a nationalistic like fervor of like "Ah, fuck those other people and that's the only way you get people back in line and but you see people standing up in various ways and as an empire collapses like this uh one of the ways you deal with it is by surveilling your citizens more and more and cracking down on dissent more and more. And we've seen both of those things over the past 10 years, just a hugely aggressive surveillance of American citizens and more and more rights violations of American citizens because it's the only way to maintain a collapsing empire. And I think, go ahead. And that, and and again, like that sort of othering that we see, not just, you know, the cracking down on your own people, but the othering that makes it possible to crack down on your own people, be it like, oh, well, we have to surveil the Muslim Americans because, you know, they're Muslim, but also then makes it an excuse to bomb those other nations. And, you know, I I, I was I was messaging this to, to a couple of friends who sent me articles uh, about China and I said, be, just be very careful about the anti-China propaganda right now because it is on, like, oh, heavy, it is it is heavy. at at peak right now. Mm. And it's not to say that you should think of China as this benevolent, perfect nation. It's not. But it's certainly not this, like, evil nation that's trying to spread coronavirus and infect your fucking testicles with it. Like, that's not <laughs> that's not what they're trying to do. Um, so, I, like, be, be very wary of the extreme othering that happens in these moments of crisis particularly with an empire that is at war literally and figuratively with uh, the majority of the world, whether that be economically or literally physically boots on the ground, but be very, very careful about that othering. 
because that othering is what will stand in the way of us actually coming up with a different way of living. And this is, again, like this is a, a, a really powerful moment to think of different ways that we can live as opposed to, quote unquote, their normal, which got us into this mess. You know, their yep. normal of oppression and yep. destruction and othering. And so be careful, be really careful. And I'm saying this to myself and to Lee and everybody else, too. It's not like I have all the answers. But, you know, we all have to be careful about about this, the, the powerful propaganda machines othering people to, to drive us to that f- that peak fear that will push us back to that normal that got us into this mess in the first place. And many other, many countries are realizing exactly what you're saying, like that things need to change. And, you know, many other countries are realizing a global community is the only way we're going to tackle our environmental problems and our climate change problems. And mm-hmm. Uh, and I think they're looking at the U.S. more and more and some other countries like Brazil as outliers of like, well, their leadership is a catastrophe, but we need to start working as if, you know, they are the special child in the class and they just leave them in the corner to, uh, you know, bite on their elbow and we'll deal with things over here. Do you um, know that it's physically impossible to lick your own elbow? Hold on well, a second while I try. <laughs> <laughs> How many of you listening actually just tried to do that? I'm just curious. Uh, Give me three more minutes. (laughs) Uh, (laughs) Sorry, that was uh, an unnecessary interjection. I apologize. Um, In these last couple of minutes, I want to uh, do this because I think it's hilarious. Um, This is... and. I'll, I'll, I'll give you a little bit of a segue, which is that the propaganda and everything needs to be increased in these times in order to try and prop up a dying empire. You have to cause more fear. You have to uh, you know, create more propaganda and make it larger scale and heavier. And so we see that on our network, you know, corporate television channels. And I mean, it's amazing to watch these Trump press conferences where he's calling the New York Times fake news because of one of their accurate articles that they printed about his failure to act with coronavirus. That's legitimate news. Now, they are fake news half the rest of the time when they're putting forward U.S. propaganda, uh, war, pro-war propaganda that goes on endlessly uh, and just agrees with everything the Trump administration does. I mean, these are you call the New York Times, CNN, MSNBC, all of them will call Trump a maniac unless he's doing some awful shit to some other country. And then they're like, right on. This guy's brilliant. <laughs> So, you know, the the fucking war against Venezuela, Iran, and all these places, they're fine with it. Anyway, this is a a great article. Many of you may know. I know Eleanor probably does not because she (laughs) hasn't seen CNN in five years. But many of you probably know that Chris Cuomo, who's this host on CNN, he got coronavirus. So then he's been doing shows from his house with coronavirus, talking about how awful it is. And I'm sure it is awful. Um, But apparently... He did a radio show where I guess he has a weekly radio show where he said he's not happy with what he's been doing professionally. And then apparently a bunch of other media. Neither is anyone else. We'll get to that. And then apparently a bunch of other outlets, uh, you know, ran with the headline. Chris Cuomo says he's not happy at CNN and everything. Um, And then he did basically an apology tour. Because he's just inked like a very long Uh, new deal uh. with CNN where he's probably getting millions of dollars, I'm sure. And uh, and this quote from him basically on his apology tour is hilarious. Uh, He talks about how wonderful CNN is. It's a wonderful place. He loves what he's doing. It's incredible. He didn't mean what he said. Uh, But then this part I thought was key. This This is a quote. It is, however, frustrating to do this job in an environment where people are not interested and opened and open. It is hard to practice journalism. He's calling what he does journalism. It's hard to practice journalism when people are so intent on believing what they want to believe for political advantage. Dude, you do like nothing but Mm pro-war horseshit fucking furthering the U.S. empire and capitalistic exploitation of the working man and woman 
all day, every day. And sure, you have some legitimate, correct criticisms of Trump, and then also fucking half an hour of bullshit Russiagate. So you are, you have shat in your own bed, my fa- my friend, all right? So to act like, it's so upsetting, people don't believe the shit I make up about <laughs> Why America needs to fucking go to war with Iran and fucking put economic war on Venezuela. And, and, then, and then he goes on, it makes you question, is it worth the effort? Can no, I, please stop. Can I make a difference? Can I personally make a difference? Is the way I'm doing this working? I love where I am. I love what I do. That doesn't mean it isn't frustrating. I don't think it's ever mattered more than it has during this administration. And you're like, oh, my God, dude. Did you really just pretend that you're a journalist? Just pretend that you do anything but propagandistic horseshit just because you have some correct uh, uh, criticism of Trump as a fucking clown? That makes you a journalist? No, you are just propping up imperialistic, colonial fucking killing machine that's your daily job and to and manufacturing consent for a capitalistic economy well, that exploits doesn't even, 90 percent of human beings that's your job he doesn't even have a correct uh read on trump because he's not going to the core issue anybody can say that trump's an idiot and an asshole but that doesn't go to the core issue of right. what got him into office right you know so it's I, it, it, that shit is again like that that's just part of that facade and it's part of the the mirage democracy that we all live in. And uh, again, like just sort of wrapping up here, like please beware. Cause I know it feels like we're, we're walking through like a desert of crisis right now. It's a, it's a shit storm and they are doing all they can to paint this beautiful oasis that, that has water and, and, and scantily clad, attractive people serving you Mai Tais and, and, and lawn mm. chairs and, and the, the, the music that you like, like, but it's all a fucking mirage, just like this whole fucking democracy, just like the whole thing. And I mean, we just have to we have to get through this. And uh, again, because I'm Walter from The Big Lebowski, the only way that we can get through this and beyond is mutual aid. <laughs> I'm yes. <laughs> I'm yes. <laughs> Thank you for that. Uh uh, we're going to go over and do a little extra content at patreon.com slash common censored. You guys make this show possible. We have no ads or anything. Um, also, if you are due a copy of the book moment of clarity, because you've been a member at patreon.com slash common censored, please shoot me an email at uh, common censored at protonmail.com. You can also give us topic suggestions, suggestions, and uh, now go check out my free stand-up comedy special at leecampamerican.com. Until next time, act out. Keep fighting.